Thank you, folks. Um, please welcome to the stage, by the way, another hand for uh, Jim Rogers. Thanks so much for having us. Glad to have him back with us uh, at, the, at the convention last time. The convention was 1979, so we're really happy to have him here. Now, next, I'd like you to welcome, please welcome to the stage, elected libertarian Ruth Bennett.
saying, Michael, do you think the Libertarian Party has outlived its usefulness? And I've, I've had that question asked to me a few times because sometimes we don't have elections that turn out as well as other times. Not every campaign can be like the Sarvis campaign up in Virginia. Not every campaign can be like John Kuhn's campaign up in Michigan. Not every campaign can be like Carla Howell's 2000 campaign against Ted Kennedy where she spit, finished less than a half a point behind the Republican. They can't all be that way, but every single candidate, every single libertarian here is vital, and I want to tell you why. There was a book written in the early 1970s by Jerome Tachilli called It Usually Begins with Ayn Rand. In the book, he argued that everybody who found their way to libertarianism had read Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead or The Virtue of Stinginess or Capitalism, The Human Ideal. Yeah, I know, I, I misstated that. And that was true many, many, many years ago. But if you ask new libertarians where they came from, if you ask new libertarians what was their first contact with the ideas and the word libertarian, they found it on the ballot with Libertarian Party candidates. We are the gateway to the Libertarian movement. When I was talking to Jeff Riggenbach, Jeff said, well, I, I, I like your rhetoric, and I said, it's not rhetoric, it's reality, Jeff. This is good for you because I thought it was important that I help Jeff grow spiritually. And, it, and I said, whatever we're going to crit critique the Libertarian Party with, whatever metric we want to use, let's use that same metric with Cato, with Reason, with the Rockwell Organization, with the Heartland, so that we're comparing everybody by the same ruler. And I said, let's ask ourselves, is Cato obsolete? I think not. I think it's a valuable resource. It does a number of great things to advance Libertarian ideas, don't you? What about the people in Reason? Reason has done more to publicize libertarianism than any nonpartisan organization in America because they put freedom first almost always, except when they're being snarky. And they're a terrific organization, aren't they? And you've got to have heart. Come on. They're terrific too. And there are a number, whether it's the Institute for Justice, whether it's uh, FIJA, the Fully Informed Jury Amendment Association. There are organizations out there, but the Libertarian mission is unique and indispensable. You are the first contact most people will ever have with the word Libertarian, with the ideas of the Libertarian Party. You will be the gateway. I have met so many people where I would see in 2012, Harry jo uh, 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 Johnson uh, bumper sticker, and I would ask them, how did you come to find out about the Libertarian Party? And they said, well, I got a sample ballot. And I saw the word Libertarian. I saw Democrat, Republican, and I saw Libertarian. What's that? I said, what'd you do? I Googled it. You gotta watch these people when they Google, they find out stuff. I said, what'd you find out over here, Google? And they said, I found the Libertarian Party listed there. And I went there and I looked at the platform and I said, that's me! There are these wandering tribes of libertarians everywhere across America that are only waiting for our first libertarian candidate to run in their district, in their state, in their community, for their city council, for their county board of supervisors, for their assembly, for their aldermen. Libertarian party advocates, libertarian party candidates are the reason the libertarian party and the libertarian movement is growing. Without the libertarian party, if you take away all of the people that we brought in through the prescience of Dave Nolan and the founders of our political party. If you take away everybody who found their way to Cato through the Libertarian Party, it'd be the two Koch brothers talking to Ed Grade, and that's it. And if you did the same with the reason, it would be Manny Klausner, Timor McCann, and Bob Poole talking to each other going, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Where did they get their members? They got it from Libertarian Party campaigns, again and again and again. Let me prove it to you. I don't want you to take my word for it. Don't just say, well, Michael has this opinion. I think it's really important to actually back your opinions with facts. I am a Libertarian. Reason. Ladies and gentlemen, 
We have in politics something I call the Super Bowl principle. How many of you watched the Super Bowl earlier this year? By applause. <laughs> Average football viewership on TV is about 20 million viewers. Do you know what the viewership of the Super Bowl was this year? 112 million viewers. Almost six times as many people as go to a regular game. Why is this important to you? Because the presidential sweepstakes is the Super Bowl of politics. More people and more communities are discussing libertarian candidates because it's a presidential election year. They look at the Democratic nominee. They, they look at the Donald. And they say, that is not a choice, that is a dilemma. You have two candidates with more people who hate them than love them. You think they've been married several times. Whether, and this is true whether it's Hillary with her 60% disapproval rating, it's true whether it's Donald Trump with his 70% disapproval rating. The people are not disapproving of their personalities. If they were doing good work, people would forgive their personalities. They're getting these kinds of negatives because of their policies, because of their politics, because of their big government, ever-growing, greedy reach of the state into more and more sectors of our lives. When people were asked, why do you watch the Super Bowls, they found out everybody wasn't watching it for the game. It turned out that a certain percentage of the people 45% were watching the game itself. And this was done through actual surveys and retailers. 23% were there to see the commercials. 15% were getting together with friends for a party. That's a good reason to be there. 10.5% thought Beyonce was hot. They like to have that show. And then a certain number of people like going to the parties where they have all these covered dishes and prepared foods that they could nosh on and find a little comfort in. But because of the Super Bowl bringing them together, they heard all about football, more than they ever wanted to know. Because of the presidential Super Bowl that we're having this year, our presidential candidates will get the widest possible hearing, the widest possible audience, more people, more often, exposed for the first time to our libertarian ideas. Isn't that terrific? I asked Jeff Riggenbach, and he says, yes, that's true, but you've never elected a president. You've never elected a vice president. You've never elected a U.S. senator. Michael, the Libertarian Party, has never elected a U.S. congressman. And I said, that's true. Some things do take time. And then I said, Jeff, do you know what year the NAACP was founded? And I don't know whether you know, but I do. It was founded in 1909 after a lynching in Abe Lincoln's hometown. It took 45 years to get to Brown versus the Board of Education and the first major victory of the NAACP. Why should it surprise us that good-hearted Americans should have as much trouble finding their way to a victory for the Libertarian Party, our presidential candidates, our senators, and our congressional candidates? Some things take time. We know from looking at the two old parties that it's really easy to raise weeds. They do it for a living. But if you want forests of redwoods and oaks and massive and beautiful trees, those can sometimes take decades and sometimes centuries. We are on the path to liberty. We are in the leadership for liberty. We are in the first contact business for liberty to bring these people in to expose them to these libertarian ideas. And whether they stay active with the Libertarian Party, or whether they go on and they work with Cato or Hartland or Reason, whether they work with any of the other fine libertarian organizations, doesn't matter. Because a libertarian victory anywhere is a libertarian victory everywhere. <laughs> but this year is a really special year. If you asked people a year ago, what would you bet that Donald Trump will be the Republican?
Lord you nominee. You couldn't have taken God any bets. If you went over to the London, London, they have betting pools on who's going to be the nominee. And Donald Trump was somewhere behind Wendell Wilkie. Wasn't doing well. You wouldn't have expected him to be here. Something unusual is happening. I feel like Ghostbusters. Something strange in the neighborhood. Here's what we're seeing, unless I'm really wrong. I don't know how many of you have read the Foundation Trilogy by Isaac Asimov. We are in a Selden crisis, if you have. I don't know how many of you read Andy Grove's extraordinary book, Only the Paranoid Survive. We are in an inflection point politically. I don't know how many of you have read Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point. We are in a tipping point, and it's tipping toward liberty. More people are willing to set aside their old beliefs, especially Millennials, especially millennials, especially millennials. They are joining us. They are being exposed to our ideas through Dr. Ron Ball's campaign in 2008 and 2012, through Gary Johnson's campaign in 2012, and through many of our campaigns locally. They've been exposed to our libertarian ideas, and a lot of the millennials like what they hear. And here's the good news it was the millennials finally push same-sex marriage over to where gay men and lesbians and bisexual and transgenders were as protected by the law as heterosexuals. But it was a libertarian party who for 40 years carried that torch, drove that issue, and continued to support that cause. We are at one with the millennials on the issue. Go a step further. You've seen the ballot initiatives making marijuana the same as wine and beer. Classified exactly the same so we can end 90% of the drug war, the war against marijuana users, with over 800,000 marijuana arrests every single year in the United States. The Libertarian Party was doing this and acting and advancing this cause since our beginning as part of ending the insane war on drugs. And we are beginning to wear out. There was a book written by a sociologist named Rodney Stark called The Rise of Christianity. He was a sociologist. And he said, out of all the religions that were taking place around the Mediterranean at the time of Christ, why did Christianity triumph? And here's what he discovered in the course of looking. It turns out that Christians prospered because they valued women. Women were viewed as burdens by most religions. You had to give a dowry for someone to take her off your hands. What do you think a dowry was? Here, I'll give you two goats and I'll give you a cow if you'll take my daughter and support her because she's too much of a burden for me. What kind of an attitude is that toward women? Christianity said women have the same souls as men. They stand before God to say women should be protected and revered just as much as men. And because of it, when it was time for those pagans to get married, only the Christian girls were available. And who's going to be taking the kids to church? The Christian women. Who is going to be taking the kids and teaching them morality? The Christian women. Because they came out for expanding respect for all genders, they grew their organization. And they grew it hugely. Today, there are two massively growing movements. One is flawed off a little bit. One is the Mormons, a little over 10% growth per year. The other is the Unification Church, the Moonies. When Rodney Stark examined these groups, he found they were doing the same thing as early Christianity. Plus, they were doing one more thing. They were getting most of their new members of their church, not from other churches. The Unification didn't go over to see the, the Lutherans, or go over to see the Baptists, or go over to see the Seventh-day Adventists. They went and talked to people who were unchurched, who were not involved. And where do most of our new members come from? Not Democrats and Republicans, but people who have never been involved in politics. And we finally hit their point where they go, I've got to do something about this. And only the Libertarian Party offers me what I want. That's the growth we're beginning to see here. I want to share with you one important idea before I go. You might think, I'm just running a little campaign, I don't matter. Or I'm a volunteer.
volunteer for uh, a city council race and we're not going to win. Or I'm helping with a state legislative race and I'm not sure how we're going to do. And what difference could it make? Your race could be the race that comes into contact with the new Tom Payne. Your race could be the race that comes into contact with the new Ayn Rand, or Murray Rothbard, or Ludwig von Mises, or Isabel Patterson, or Rose Wilder Lane. Your race could be the one that comes into contact with the next Dave Nolan, who will help take us to even higher heights. Your race could be the one that touches them and says, join us, explore us, see whether it makes sense to you. Your race could be the guarantee of the triumph of liberty. I'm here to say something. We are in an inflection point. We are in a paradigm shift. We're at a tipping point. This year, we're going to get more exposure than we ever have. Put your best foot forward. I know you will. If you haven't volunteered for a campaign, you don't have to be a full-time libertarian. One weekend of help makes all the difference. Candidates, is that not true? One Sunday afternoon, going door to door, hanging out leaflets, and people realizing you're not Seventh-day Adventists, you're Libertarians, can make a big difference in the content. You're going out to the news media and sharing these ideas of individual liberty, personal responsibility, every man, woman, and child's right to their own life, liberty, property. That and that alone will advance our cause. I'm here to tell you right now, in 2012, our presidential ticket got over 1.3, got 1.3 million votes. But the rest of our candidates from bottom to top of the ticket got 15 million votes. I believe that our presidential ticket this time will do 4 million to 6 million votes, maybe more. Who can tell? I believe that our down ticket votes won't just stay at 15 million, it'll do 17 million, 20 million, 25 million, because America is hungry, hungry for the liberty ideas of the Libertarian Party. I've been a Libertarian my whole adult life, and I've never been so proud of Libertarians as I am today. I am so grateful for the work you do. And there are people all throughout the halls and the events here are equally grateful for your work. So I want to share this with you. Reach out and make contact to the new libertarians. Invite them in, get them involved, bring them to a meeting, have them help with the campaign, 